Um, without further ado, Bob. So we're really confusing everyone today because they're trying to guess um, and I do sound a little bit Australian as well. So thank you for having me today. This is a real treat for me because um, usually I do kind of hardcore security uh, speak, uh, talks and you know a lot of these people haven't left their room in sort of two or three years and into the daylight so this is a real treat to do something completely different and, and to think about UX and design around security. Yeah, good, thank you. So this inverted image of me here. So um, I spent a good part of my life, um, so far my adult life, as an ethical hacker. Is it, anyone familiar with that expression? So basically you go around testing other people's systems to see if you can break into them. So I was working as a network engineer in the UK um, and I saw this job advert and I thought that sounds cool so I went and applied for it and I got the job and they took me out to Denmark to teach me how to be an ethical hacker which was a fantastic experience because working with Danish people is kind of brutal but really good because <laughs> they don't, there's no bullshit they're like Rob you're not very good at this are you and you know so that it was a great experience for me and they literally I lived in Copenhagen for a year and they taught me how to hack and i um, very thankful to have that experience because it was, it was great fun, although the winters are a little bit dreary there. Um, so I started my own company um, and I spent uh, seven years with uh, a team of ethical hackers and we tested pretty much anything you can think of, like we got onto a nuclear submarine, we tested um, like traffic lights was one of the weird ones, and a, a coffee machine, which was weird back then, not so much now. We were, I worked in GCHQ, which is like the Pentagon of, of the UK, it's just smaller, like everything. Um, and we tested thousands of systems and to, to see how we can break into them, essentially. And I was lucky enough to sell that business, so I started another security business, um, which was looking after the, high net, uh, the assets of high net worth individuals. So I can see all these celebrities' phones getting hacked, and I'm like, you know, there's a business here. So we set it up, but it had one major problem, and that is rich people don't like to spend money, particularly celebrities. They want everything for free. So I did manage to sell that one, but it was kind of like a, a lucky escape more than anything else. And then I, I co-founded Dogtown Media. Um, we're out in Venice. Uh, I fancied making things instead of breaking them, and I thought, let's make some software, because I'm always the guy with the, with the um, bad uh, news, you know? So let's do something creative. Um, Apparently, we're a collaborative team of innovators, thinkers, and problem solvers. That's the marketing managers nodding at me. But we make really solid software, and we think a lot about security because obviously my background is that, so I try and always think about that. We're doing a lot of medical stuff this, these days, which really, obviously, you need to think heavily about security. Um, what I'm going to do today is, they said, why don't you come along and talk about computer security, right? So there's been about 40 years of that. Um, and the UX based around that. So I thought, well, how can I make this sort of digestible um, and in, in the 30, 40 minutes that I've got today? So what I wanted to do is focus on the end user, right? So not these guys, right? Not the nerds in the computer room. Um, no disrespect, because I'm one of them, but you know, I want to focus on the, the end user, the consumer, and how security has interacted with them over the years. Um, we're going to look a little bit at the history of hacking. Again, it's a very broad subject, so we'll look at some specific cases. We'll look at hacking today um, and how that uh, works alongside some of the sort of user experience on websites and devices and everything else. And then what's the next phase of hacking? What's going to come next? So we're going to focus on three areas. I hope none of you designed this website here. It's the worst website I can find. Okay, so I spent a little while and I googled worst website and I think that one came out as officially the worst website ever coded. So we're going to look at web, we're going to look at personal computers, which have obviously been a huge part of the landscape for um, you know, uh, the last 20 years, and mobile devices, right, which are obviously the way things are trending right now. And we're going to look at the security around them and the user experience of that security. 
Okay, so starting off with pre-internet era, moving on to like web uh, one, two G, and web two and three G, and then onwards. So we'll cover these as we go along. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about the early days of hacking, right? And so this is one of the most, the, the earliest examples I can find. Although I did read that, like the first official hack was. Um, Marconi, who invented Morse code and, and basically transmitting radio signals, he apparently was a very arrogant person and he said, oh, this thing can't be intercepted. He did a demonstration in London and someone actually hacked his Morse code demo and put different words into it that weren't supposed to be there, rats, 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 apparently. <laughs> so that was the earliest, like, um, kind of uh, hacking uh, that I could find. But I think this is really the most, the, the first mod, kind of modern systems type of hacking. And again, this is like pre-internet. Um, most of you are too young to remember that. I'm probably one of the oldest people here. But um, this was something called freaking. Have you guys heard of freaking at all? Yeah. OK, yeah. so yeah, sounds good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is where basically the old telephone systems would operate on the, the touch tones that actually go along the line. So they would listen and you could emulate those by literally playing the same down, uh, telephone uh, uh, sounds down them. And you could bounce around the world and you could get free calls. And um, this is actually how a lot of the big, uh, like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Wojcik was the act, they started doing this stuff and building these things and selling them, basically to allow free phone calls. You can't do it anymore because they're digital systems, but I can actually open the gate on my building complex with uh, by hitting nine, and uh, because it's listening for that to open the gate on a, on a little um, app that I've got. So, but most of this won't work now. But this is one of the, you know, the, it's the start of hacking, if you like. This was one of the earliest kind of documented hackers. This guy is really, really well known. He's obviously fairly local as well. Um, he uh, started really early at the age of twelve by hacking the LA bus system. Um, and the punch cards to, to be able to get free trips, which is pretty ingenious, it's got to be said. And then at, at 16, he broke in and basically stole a copy of someone's operating system. Um, unfortunately, they detected that hack and then he went on the run for, um, I think, about five or six years. Um, and it, during that was, I don't know, two and a half years, he broke into loads of other computer systems. He um, stole hundreds of uh, cell phones and, and, and their numbers, and um, basically went on a right and eventually got put in, in prison for that. He now is, you know, he's written like five or six book, books, the most, um, the famous is The Art of Deception, which is a really good hacking book. I mean, he's now a security consultant. He specialized in social engineering. Um, are you guys familiar with that, that term? Okay, so, yeah, most of you. So, it's basically, where instead of just using computers for hacking, you're using you know, yourself, you're using other ways to get information out of people. And I, I did a lot of this in my career. I'm not sure I was great at it, it's fairly terrifying. But my first job was um, to break into a credit card company. Um, and so I printed up a, uh, I, I went into the reception to ask one day, just to ask them for directions and I could see who supplied their um, fire extinguishers. So I went off and I printed a badge with the same company and I bought some overalls and I went back and I said, you've got some 40 fire extinguishers and we need to go around the building and find them. And the security guard took me around the building and eventually let me into the server room and I said, listen, I need to look at these um, a little bit more and ring my boss up to find out if these are the 40 ones. And unfortunately, the guy left me in the server room for an hour and so I plugged my computer in to a pretty major credit card company. Um, so, I mean, honestly, like, it sounds really cool. I was sweating. <laughs> and I, I was like, I had a suit jacket. Sorry, under that, I had the, um, you know, this overall one, and I was just pouring with sweat. But it was a really good feeling. The second one I did was uh, a nuclear fuels company, and I couldn't find a way to genuinely be there, so I asked if I could use the toilet, and they let me into the back of the office, and the, and the lady on the front desk forgot I was there. And I spent an hour walking around, and I walked out with things with ke like chemical equations all over them, and I walked out the building um, with those. So the first two were pretty nerve-wracking, but pretty successful, I think. So as soon as the company grew, I stopped doing that stuff because I wasn't the best person to do that, quite honestly. Um, so yeah, he, he pioneered this, really. And that's, uh, if you go to DEF CON or any of the other security conferences, they do this stuff live. 
So you'll go into a room at DEF CON and they'll be trying to get information out of AT&T. And so we, you sit there in the audience and they tell everyone to shush and they ring these companies up and go, oh, hi, it's Bob at the you know, Marina Del Rey branch. Uh, you know, our systems have gone down. Could you just check this phone number for me? Or could you check you know, like their details? Um, and it's fascinating to watch these guys at work because they are professionals. Um, so this is early connections. Okay, so we're talking about pre internet. Um, this was a, a, a little gif or, a, a originally, but um, can I play that? Doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. No, we can't. It's fine. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, again, I'm not sure I, many of you are old enough to remember this, but before the internet existed, if you wanted to use a computer and connect to anyone else, you would literally pick up uh, your phone and put it on a modem and you would dial out, essentially. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it didn't look like the internet now. It looked kind of, it's all text-based, not very attractive. Um, but this is how things started off. Right here, there's no user experience, right? The user experience, I imagine, wasn't even a term at this point because this is late 70s, early 80s, and I doubt it was even a thing then. Um, and basically, it was you know, mostly text-driven and pretty ugly. I thought as we were in Hollywood, we were going to look also at what hackers look like on, in films throughout the years. So this is what your early 80s hackers look like. Um, this is War Games. Um, that actually computer in the background looks so like an AMSIL 8080, which is like a 1970s computer, but it, it has 32 kilobytes of RAM, which is about the size of like a small Word document, basically. But um, this, is, this is what hackers look like, apparently, in Hollywood um, in the 80s. So we're going to start off with looking at like early web. So this is when the internet was first coming out. What was the user experience? What was the user experience around security? Okay, so these are very, very early um, versions of Websites. So we've got Amazon, eBay, and Yahoo. Um, I pronounce Yahoo weirdly, and I appreciate that. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. um, they obviously very text-driven, the early stuff, where a few sites did have places for you to put in your username and your password. Okay, there was very little. Um, uh, there's very little validation on that. You know, it doesn't ask for particularly long passwords, or it doesn't ask for any kind of like specific type of password. Um, and, but what is interesting is this is early days and really what's changed that much since these days of a username and a password? This thing seems to have persisted over the years but changed in the way that the security is presented to the end user and we'll, we'll go through that. Um, I've got some, some little toys with me. This would be a 1G kind of phone sort of coming out around, around this time. Um, it still turns on, but I don't think it's going to going to connect this to anything. So, go. So, what did it look like when these uh, the, the first internet connected PCs look, uh, uh, came about? What did hacking look like? Well, you know, we just saw very limited validation on the user inputs of. What type of password you require? Is it going to be a long password? Is it complicated? You know, all that kind of stuff. And so, early days, um, I remember using this tool. You could very easily brute force a password, right? So if you could find a website, and you could sit there and go, right, I'm going to try every single word in the English dictionary against this with someone's, you know, you managed to find out that your friends on it, and you know their um, their email address. So you would be able to basically send thousands and thousands of requests to this because there's very little password policy and it's, there's nothing enforced, right? So I remember using these tools and they were successful and you could do max hacks by basically just firing really well-known passwords at sites and English words and football teams is a great one in the UK, okay? Because the, um, the designers of websites, right at that point, hadn't thought about this stuff. Okay, you know, they they hadn't thought. Well, we really need a strong password. We really need to contain this, and we need to validate these things in some way. What did desktops look like? Well, really, really confusing for the most part. 
um, incomprehensible messages, you know, like that only an admin or someone that was really into computers uh, would use. So anything to do with security, I don't know if you guys remember early Internet Explorer, it was mind-boggling. Um, it came out about 95, I think, and there was all sorts of messages that would pop up. No one knew really what they meant. You would just hit yes, no until something worked. Early antivirus, um, you know, really kind of like difficult to understand for the most part. Um, and again, on desktops, no password policy. If you want to use 1234 as your password, okay, there's nothing there to stop you doing that. There was no thought about this user experience for security at that point, okay? And this is what allowed people to put in poor and insecure passwords. I, I found this, and um, I, it's got nothing really to do with security, but I wondered if anyone else had seen it, because I've never seen it. This was a Microsoft product that came out for about six months, and the engineers decided that instead of having a desktop, you would have a room in your house, your virtual house for each um, application. So if you wanted to write a Word document, you would go to the library. Okay, and it was called Microsoft Bob. It's probably the ugliest thing I think I've ever seen. And they pulled it after about six months. And this is why engineers should never design user experience. Because this is what you end up with. Does anyone remember that? Anyone say, oh you do? I, I've never heard of it and I just, for this presentation I came across it. It's really, really horrendous. And I think they knew instantly that they'd made a mistake. So what did hacking look like on, on early desktops? Well, I, I remember these days, because there's no part of password policy and the way that computers stored information, um, it was very, very easy to break. Uh, um, if you got into a system to be able to reverse the passwords, the password hashes back into passwords. Just like, it's, it's pretty simple how desktop PCs um, store passwords, and they still do it these days just in a slightly more secure way, but when you type in your password, it runs it through a one-way encryption algorithm, and it makes a hash. And the idea is that if you put the same password in again, you get the same hash, okay? So, um, but to get the hash back into the password should be really difficult. But of course, you know, there's really smart people out there who came out with these tools. So one person decided that well, instead of trying to just guess the hashes, why don't we pre-compute every password possibility that you can have and store those hashes somewhere They're called rainbow tables. So when you come to hack somewhere, you've already got all those hashes, so you just check it. And these, these tools came around in the early, uh, early days because of no password policy, no uh, UX around security particularly. It was all done by engineers. So, you know, early cell phones I've got. What have I got here? Um, this one's probably 2G. This was an early BlackBerry. Actually, this is one of the first BlackBerrys. Um, I, uh, I, I, I bought six of these off eBay, and they still had the email accounts on them. Um, and the guy was, send, he was sending his girlfriend emails saying, I'm worried about the Iraq war. <laughs> I'm not making this up. He was saying that how smoky it was in Denny's and how that was annoying him. Um, it was absolutely fascinating. I spent like two hours going through all these old um, these devices. And uh, yeah, it was amazing what was on there. It was like a little time capsule. They all, they all still work, they just need charging up. So early cell phones, um, 2G. So this is like kind of pre your know, iPhone, Android, and everything else. There wasn't any security, really. There was a pin code at the most. But what did we have to secure? We had contacts, we had SMS voice and calls. So there's no data on there really, you know, there's no email yet on there particularly, there's no um, things that you would want to do. I mean, I think they had pin codes, most of them, but I didn't see anyone that used them. If you lost your phone, then someone, you know, probably used it to ring, ring out. So, what do 90s hackers look like? Okay, so this is um, Hackers, the film, um, and they were, this was about, I think about a virus, and they were trying to stop this crazy virus or something, I need to watch it again. But this is what Hollywood thinks 90s hackers are. Um, the toothbrush, I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> Pretty interesting. I really should watch it again, like, uh, it's, it's been a while. Let's go back one. Okay, so then we're moving into 
Web 2.0 and 3G, where this is something that's starting to become, I think, more familiar to most people. So um, we see websites start to put on things like Capture, okay, as part of their user experience around security. Um, you guys, probably everyone's familiar with Capture, right? So, you know, we had this problem we were talking about earlier, brute forcing. I'm going to send, like, thousands of passwords to the website and see if I can guess it. Well, you know, the next phase was we're going to stop that by putting the, uh, something that only a human, presumably, can, you know, um, over and, and can look at the code and, and then submit the password. So this was, like, the, really the next phase. And, and also, um, you know, password policies. So they're like, oh, we keep getting hacked because everyone's password's one, two, three, four. So let's put in some basic password policy. So this is um, sort of early 2000s. We're starting to get to a point where security is thought about. It's been driven, I think, mainly because of so much hacking and so many websites being um, broken into. Um, and we're starting to see some of the stuff that we kind of see today, really. Um, personal uh, computers started be to become a little bit more friendly at this point. And again, they tried to then reach out to the end user um, rather than some security engineer or some computer engineer. So, you know, comprehensible messages about firewalls. You know, you really need to switch on your firewall because it's a problem. Um, cleaner design, this is an early map, but you can see you know, it's like, it, it's definitely, there's been some thought out design on um, the, how the end user would, would, would interact with that as opposed to the earlier ones which were very sort of nerd driven. And then, um, I remember these when they first started coming around, there was password managers, okay, for the first time because suddenly we got rid of these simple passwords but we now need password managers to store these more complex passwords. Okay, so these things started popping up on, on desktops as well. Okay, and then we started sort of obviously getting smartphones. This is, uh, this is the first Android uh, smartphone, um, which actually I think is pretty cool. It's got a nice little keyboard and um, uh, you know, I, think, I think it's quite a nice sort of neat design and I've got the first iPhone which is, looks tiny now, how little it is. Because we're all used to carrying around these huge things in our, in our pockets now. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, when these devices start to become um, widespread. So we, before we really didn't have that much to secure, so I don't think people were thinking about security. And now we're starting to think, well, we need to secure emails. We've now got email on our phone. And we've also got photos, which is probably the biggest one, right? People have you know, taken photos of their family and they're walking around with those in their pocket. I still don't remember, though, that many people securing their phones. I think early iPhone, everyone pretty much had them unlocked except security people. And security people probably didn't have iPhones. So, um, but the design was intuitive. It was easy to set a passcode and easy to put in. Obviously, there's no biometrics yet. It's just you know putting in passwords or, or simple passcodes. So, what are 2000 hackers, <laughs> early 2000 hackers look, look, look like? Well, Australian. I've got to say that out of all of them, this is the worst representation of hacking. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've seen it. At one point, he starts like moving cubes round on the screen uh, to hack into the FBI or something like that. It's pretty. It's pretty bad, but they're kind of like now looking less nerdy and a bit more sophisticated. So, sort of moving into more current hacking um, or sort of user experience about security. Um, it, passwords, albeit more secure, are still getting compromised all the time. So people wanted to find more and more secure ways to, to authenticate people. How many people here just use two-step authentication on a regular basis? So an SMS message or, right, okay, that's good. That's really good to see. Because if I'd asked that two or three years ago, that probably, five years ago, that definitely wouldn't have been the case. We'll talk about SMS in a little bit. 
And then we have, how many people use an authenticator app? Okay, so yeah, you know, we're now trying to make, um, obviously it's still easy enough to log into these systems, um, but um, you know, there is a little bit of inconvenience there, but it's because the hackers are always like one step ahead, essentially. Um, and they're able to use phishing techniques and other things to be able to get into your account um, and get your um, password details. So um, this is something that came out fairly, fairly recently, that, um, and I'm sure you guys have designed websites, have designed them with, um, you know, they've got to be A characters, right? And they've got to uh, have uppercase and lowercase, and they've got to have numbers and all that kind of stuff in. And then of course, then you can't remember them, and they're ridiculous. So NIST, which is the National Institute of um, Standards and Technology, which a lot of companies follow for their recommendations around security, now say, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, we're going to recommend that you don't use dictionary words, you don't use repetitive characters, you know, straight A's or whatever. You don't use context specific, so if you're website is Ticketmaster, you want to stop people using Ticketmaster as their password or something around that. And this is the, the big one. They're saying they no longer want people to um, use passwords obtained from previous breach corpuses, <laughs> um, which is another way of saying hack, uh, passwords that have already been hacked. Okay, if any of you um, use, um, have I been pwned, have I been owned? Okay, so this is a site that will tell you if your, if your um, account has been already caught up in a hack and you can sign up and they'll say, you know what, your email address was part of a hack involved in you know, XYZ company. Um, and these guys document all the passwords that have previously been hacked. Now, this is a bit of um, self-promotion on my part. This is a site I run um, and we basically put together 560 million previously hacked passwords into a database, which was an interesting import, um, uh, trying to get it all in there. So a site, a website could come in and check against this to see if the password you're trying to use has been hacked before. Um, and when there's 580 million of them, there's often a chance that it will be. But this is the current best practice for passwords. This is what people are recommending, rather than the, the one, two, three, four, uh, sorry, the uppercase, lowercase, and everything else. Um, so if anyone wants any information on that, I did put some links at the end, and it's free to use, um, and just keeps it busy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about SMS. Um, and unfortunately, it seems that um, SMS is not as safe as you think. Now I use it because some of my like accounts don't have any other option. But just recently, you know, I was kind of, when you work in security, you're like, oh, what now? <laughs> like, why isn't SMS safe? So there's two particular things, and this is a really good example of it. The first one is to do with SIM swapping. Okay, so SIM swapping is where you get someone's details, so someone finds out my date of birth. I'm really young, obviously. Um, and and uh, they find out where in my address, and they find out my mother's main name, and then, then they bring up AT&T, or Sprint, or Verizon, or whoever, and they say, oh, you know what, my, um, I need to swap my SIM card into another phone. Um, and then they get it swapped to their phone. So if they've already managed to take your password, they'll then uh, get the SMS sent to their phone. And that's exactly what happened when these 40 Bitcoins were taken from Coinbase. They used exactly this Silicon Valley investor guy, suddenly got no signal on his phone, and the next thing you know, all his Bitcoins have been emptied out of his account. And they used that exact te technique. SS7's really scary. That basically is a protocol that is used to route um, SMSs um, and calls around the mobile network. So say I'm in the UK, it knows how to get my message to the US, to someone's phone but you can buy access to that network and you can route other people's SMSs through your computer. It's not easy, but if you've got money, you can do it. So again, that's being used to bypass this type of security. Um, so, you know, this is personal computers now. We're seeing more robust password managers. We're seeing, you know, there's no local accounts now. Um, you're seeing uh, the, P, uh, the, the consistents want you to use a cloud account to log into your system so they can back everything out, uh, up. And 
and they also manage some of your passwords. So it's been a huge leap forward in, in the way that, that the operating systems deal with this, this stuff. And then um, smartphones. Um, obviously what we've got now, 5G, we've got biometrics. And um, you know we've been using pin codes for such a long time and passwords for such a, such a long time. Now we've got fingerprints and we've got face. And it's actually like, um, you know, brought up this really good point that, and I didn't think about this, Marcella brought it up, that a face isn't actually as secure as a password, if you think about it, because say you've got a terrorist or something and he gets shot, like exactly what happened, they couldn't open that, that guy's phone, but if you've got his face or his thumbprint, then you can open that phone. So in a way, someone could force you to look at them so they could open your phone, or, you know, like a, a government state or, you know, um, whatever. So it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that we've almost gone back a little bit with the biometrics because they're really convenient and they're easy to use and they make a great user experience, but they're actually not as secure as just something that's inside your brain. Okay, so where are we going with this? I think um, more biometrics. I saw this the other day, which uses your EKG, and apparently everyone has a heartbeat fingerprint. And these guys are trying to use that as a, as a method to secure information. I've, it must work, I suppose, if they're doing it. Um, well, as you're saying, that Theranos said that they were doing things. So. <laughs> but, like, maybe it works. Um, uh, and uh, there's people bringing out multi-factor um, devices uh, that use machine learning to maybe look at your voice and the way that you type on the phone and other factors to bring authentication together. Um, and I, you know, I think from a user experience point, uh, standpoint, maybe things like chatbots instead of login forms and sign up forms, so there's more of a flow to it from, because from a security point of view, that's much more difficult to hack really than a standard login form or a sign up form or, or something like that. And I've seen some companies coming out doing that as well, so using chatbots to, to take the security information. What do 2010's hackers look like? By far the best representation <laughs> of hacking ever. Uh, this this legit. If you want to see how hacking actually works, this is legit. This is the way to, to the, 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 the stuff they do is it's really um, spot on. So very briefly, I've just got to watch the time a little bit, but talking about what's coming next. So are you guys familiar with quantum computing? Is it something that's kind of been talked about? So basically these ultra fast computers are being developed um, and they are going to cause problems for current crypto the way that passwords are stored the way that um, certificates on websites for SSL work it's debatable how soon they're going to be around but they're on their way and they will smash apart some of the systems that we use now and you know obviously around blockchain and things like that as well it's going to be some really interesting but right now you have to be a scientist, a well-funded one, to be able to access one of these, but that won't be for long. So machine learning, buzzword right now, but this could definitely be used to attack people and probably already is, right? I know, I know, do know a security engineer that built a tool that goes through a website code and basically uses some kind of machine learning algorithm to try and break into it. IoT home automation, it's coming into our lives more and more, so there's more ways that obviously we can get hacked. So there's going to be a lot of hacking and innovation around that in the near future and obviously driverless cars is another one you know we're going to be in vehicles that potentially could be hacked very soon so what do the future hackers look like well probably something machine based okay ai machine learning or oh, we go quite there yeah um and, and or at least assisted by that um i think uh it's going to be really interesting when quantum computing becomes available to everyone. Um, and I think um, you know, the next 10 years, the landscape will completely change once again. I wonder if we'll still be using passwords. Hopefully not, um, but, but we'll see. I think my time is just I, I, about. Yes, we're not supposed to ask questions now, but I, I have something. I would love for you to go back to the yeah. threats of the future yeah. and expand on those some more. Yeah, sure. What should we be designing for? Right, absolutely. So, right, so um, I think 
particularly around sort of um, machine learning and AI um, design uh, around that. I think we, th there's going to be a point when the interaction can't be based on anything um, very simple like a password. Um, it can't be based around, um, you know, like basic human interaction. So there's going to have to be multi-factor um, stuff going on there, you know. It, understanding that you generally you click the ways in a certain pattern, maybe your EKG, your biometrics, and tying these things all together. So I think for you guys, these systems, there's going to be even more APIs and SDKs that you'll be able to tap into. But I think the design of those is is um, it's going to be uh, a completely different to essentially what we're doing now. And you'll be relying on back-end systems, cloud systems much more, and things that are out of your control, not like a password or a username to be able to authenticate people, essentially. Um, am I good for time? Yeah, you're fine for time. Okay. I, 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 Google just sent me a, a Google, what do they call it? Called whatever home? Yeah. Echo? Right. Whatever? For free. Yeah. Because I guess they want to listen to what I'm doing. <laughs> you never know. It's not out of the box yet. <laughs> but this is a huge thing at the moment, it's like edge computing, you know, what information stays in your house and what information goes out to the internet. And do we really know what's going in and out? No, not right now, because that thing is obscured by huge cloud systems. And But that's a huge topic at the moment, um, how, you know, what information needs to go out and what can stay inside your house. How do we protect people? Yeah, well, that, yeah that's a, voice is a whole other thing, right? And we to come back and do a talk on that? Yeah, that, that sounds, about, <laughs> sounds about right. Um, I think we're going to do questions at the end. Right? We're going to do questions yeah. with you and Esteban. Cool. Well, I think. Is that just, it? Yeah. Okay. That's good, yeah.